Uh, welcome, everybody. I, I'm uh, Andy Rich. I'm the Dean of the Colin Powell School here at City College. It's our School of Social Sciences. And I want to welcome you to Community Power and Economic Democracy, Building a New Model for Social Justice Leadership. As a practical matter in communities, what does it mean? And what can it mean to be a social justice leader? That's our question today. And it's our a central question that animates much of the mission and the work of the Colin Powell School. As a school of social sciences, we're concerned with institutions, with ideas, with movements for change. And fundamentally, we are focused on the project of understanding how to shift power in our society and in our communities towards those who have historically not had it, and especially to those who have been denied it. And in training our students, we don't want to just understand how power shifts, but we want to actually try to accomplish it, actually see power shift toward our students and our graduates in ways that make this nation, that make this city, and that make our communities more equitable. That is our project, and that is the subject of today's discussion in many ways. Um, an important home for this work is CCNY's Masters in Public Administration program. It's led by Bobby Darival, who organized this event and whom I'm going to introduce in just a minute. Our MPA program is developing a new model for education in public management and public service leadership, one that is not just focused on training the next generation of analysts and managers, but one that puts the project of social justice at its core, and it is supporting students to become leaders in movements for social change. What we're doing in our MPA program integrates into a broader set of initiatives at the Colin Powell School, focused on social justice leadership, including a new center that we are developing in partnership with CUNY School of Labor and Urban Studies, the Leadership Center for Democracy and Social Justice. The center, which will be closely tied to our MPA program and other core undergraduate programs at, at CPS will be a training space for early and mid-career social justice leaders, a place to deepen the connections between the work leaders do and the history and the philosophy behind the project of achieving social change. So I'm really excited about that project and really how it connects to the MBA program into today's discussion. And I'm particularly grateful to have our guest, Michael Pardis, with us today. Mr. Pardis is Executive Director of the Bronx Cooperative Development Initiative, and he is a leader for social justice and in the Bronx. He's building new models for economic justice and economic democracy, and he's been working with our graduating class of MPA students on um, an absolutely outstanding capstone experience. Bobby is going to introduce him, but I just want to say as an indication of how influential and important Mr. Partis' work is, as we sent out word of today's event, I heard from partners and from leaders from across the city who wanted to be here because they admire what he's doing. It is incredibly important work. So Mr. Partis, thank you for working with us and thank you for being here today. Um, I want to turn it over to Bobby Darrell. Bobby is the executive director of our MTA program. He is a trained public health practitioner with a range of public sector and nonprofit sector experience. Bobby just passed his one year anniversary of working at City College. He began his job last April, which means that he has never really been on campus or to his office. I mean, we've let him actually go see it now, um, but he hasn't got to work there yet. And despite that, um, I figured this out when I met Bobby before he even started, he understands this place. He believes in its mission, its purpose. Um, I think he got it before he even got here. Um, and he has a transformational mindset, a sense of what's possible and a real sensitivity for how you get from where we are to where we want to get. Um, and so it's been super exciting for all of us at the Colin Powell School to work with Bobby over the last year. Um, and he's frankly already making great change, uh, including uh, in that change, uh, bringing this conversation to us. So Bobby, thank you for all the work you're doing. Thank you for organizing this event and let me turn it over to you. Wow, awesome. Uh, thank you so much, Dean Rich, for helping to establish a foundation and build such a wonderful container um, for this conversation. And also thank you uh, to the full team at the Colin Powell School um, for helping host this event. Um, welcome, everyone. Uh, it's amazing to be in community with you all this blustery Friday afternoon. Uh, right now, I'd like to actually encourage uh, anyone who feels the spirit to light up the chat and tell us what organization or school you're joining us from, or conversely, um, what borough you're zooming in from. Um, it's great to see the participation. Uh, chat participation is encouraged throughout this conversation. Please keep your comments respectful of the multitude of experiences and perspectives joining our table this afternoon. 
Uh, throughout our conversation, we will be taking questions directly from the audience. You can use the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen to pose questions directly to me and Michael. Uh, we have some great support. MPA co uh, Program Coordinator James will be queuing up questions to introduce into the discussion, and we'll do our best to cover as many as we can. Our conversation today is censored, uh, centered on movement builders. The MPA program at CCNY prepares students interested in careers in public service to lead change, challenge the status quo, and effectively manage teams and organizations to better serve our communities. At our core, we are committed to cultivating social justice leaders to shift power and disrupt inequality. Our guest for today's conversation, as you all know, is Michael Pardis. Michael Pardis is the executive director of BCDI, um, uh, a nonprofit organization focused on advancing economic democracy through shared wealth strategies and community-based planning with working class Bronx residents. He's also the co-founder of the Bronx Brotherhood Project, a volunteer-based college success and mentorship program for Black and Latino teens at New Settlement College Access Center. Prior to BCDI, Michael was a director of South Bronx Rising Together. Michael is a researcher, uh, a community leader, a movement builder, and he is also a teacher and has taught over 2,000 students in the CUNY system and is a product of our wonderful CUNY system. Michael, you are a man on a mission, and I am grateful to have uh, an opportunity to uplift your work and share your knowledge and experience with our broader community of change agents. Uh, so thank you so much for joining us today. Good afternoon, Bobby and everyone. Thank you for the warm introduction and for allowing me into community with you all. Really excited for this conversation and um, always turning words into action. And I think, Bobby, for you, you'll have this experience as your first class, quote unquote, will be coming through to see your students in the chat box, in the attendees list, um, will be something that never gets old. So looking forward to the convo. Thanks for sharing the space again. Awesome, wonderful. Um, so I would love to kind of kick us off um, in conversation with you and hear as much from your experience as possible. Uh, but before we get political, I would like us to get personal. Michael, my first question for you, what influenced you to commit yourself to activism and movement building and how did you get here? Start with the easy stuff. Um, how did I end up here? How did all those things in, in those bios and, and resumes and profiles, how did, it, how did it begin? So I think there's three points I wanna raise. The first one would be, I had an excellent early childhood education and it really set me on the course for what I do now. Um, I was, I, I attended Bronx United Parents, which was a preschool in the South Bronx. Um, it was founded by Puerto Rican activists who, you know, early childhood education has never been something that's a trend. You know, our communities have been thinking about that for a long time. So I was, I was a, a student in United Bronx Parents in the South Bronx, and it was an amazing experience. We did early childhood learning. We also had a, a social education. Um, you know, we learned... Dr. Martin Luther King's I Have a Dream speech. Like we had to repeat it verbatim in kindergarten. So I think that early kind of politicization was really uh, critical for me. I think the second thing, uh, my family really brought me into organizing movement building activist work. They always supported um, thinking about a more equitable and just society and that the outcomes that we see are not just people's behavior or deficits, but that there's a systems kind of issue. Uh, my grandmother was, um, I'm a first generation American. My grandmother's from Belize and um, my mother and my grandmother's from Belize, pardon. And so I think that that understanding of community and that grounding in outcomes and changing systems was really critical. And I always was encouraged to think that way and to stand and speak truth to power. So my family and my uh, cultural ethnic background gave me a lot of support to speak truth and have a justice analysis. Lastly, I think a pivotal moment that changed my life happened as an undergrad. Um, I was in the Black Student Union at my college, um, Hurricane Katrina. This was probably two weeks after the hurricane landed um, in you know, the New Orleans. And 
we were talking about it and talking about the black community and just talking, talking. And somebody said, so what are you going to do, Michael? Like, we've talked a lot here on this couch. But what are you going to do? What's your role? And anyway, the answer to that, I, you know, I decided to run for uh, one of the officer positions in our Black Student Union. But it really represented a calling that we have to think and do, that we have to have praxis. Um, and so I think my educational experience brought that, my early childhood experience brought that through. And when you combine all those things, that's how I show up today, believing in organizing, believing in activism, believing in movements, and um, believing in fighting forward. So that's kind of how I show up. That is fantastic. And thank you for laying that groundwork, Michael. It's so great to hear your story um, and see what elements have kind of influenced you. Um, that's really fantastic. So you are Bronx bred and born, right? Um, I wanna now kind of center the Bronx since that's such a big part of who you are and your work. Um, and specifically, I've heard you say um, that the Bronx is a place of hopeful contradictions. And so I kind of wanted, um, because you, you use that often and I think the folks at BCDI use that often and you talk about kind of the challenges of, of deficit-based learning uh, versus kind of like strength-based approaches. And so I just kind of want you to unpack that for us. What do you mean by that? So when we say hopeful contradictions, I'll, I'll start with how I could represent that and move into what our community and ecosystem um, means by that. You know, someone like me, you know, I grew up on all the social policy programs, you know, public housing, WIC, et cetera. And I think sometimes there's an argument that those programs don't uh, really produce independence or they don't produce, um, you know, like what's the return on investment? And so whenever people read my bio or see the work, you know, I think it represents that, no, our investment in social infrastructure, our investment in the society is really important. And even in a place like the Bronx, right, that that investment is also met with what people are doing on the ground. I am a product of a community of people who didn't leave when things got difficult, like arson or, um, you know, environmental injustice with um, toxic waste, toxic waste plants and inaccessibility to Bronx River. Like, People didn't leave when those things happened. People stayed. And a part of that community organizing, that local education, the walking tours, the taking time to talk at local churches, I'm a product of that. And we don't always think of our Bronx as being a place where that kind of learning, education, leadership development is happening. But it is that, no matter what the statistical outcomes may say. So I think that's one thing. The second thing in terms of hopeful contradictions, too, if we, if we peel it back, you know, I have a social science background, and the thing we often hear about the South Bronx in particular, poorest congressional district in the United States, poorest congressional district in the country, high poverty, those things are true. But the Bronx is also a place, you know, the Bronx gross domestic product is about $44 billion. $44 billion is the Bronx um, growth GDP. And if you think about it in that way, a lot of business is being done. There's money, there's assets, there's things happening. So in a place that is that does have assets and does have business, and we can talk about this later, but the point is that there is a tremendous economic opportunity that we have. And when we look at the Bronx and we look at, you know, one of the largest and most successful of the co-op movements exist in housing, where the co-op city, um, our healthcare workers and the incredible work that they do, um, up by 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 um, Jerome Avenue, there's a there's a tremendous community movement that we've had around saving public education historically around you know back in the 70s saving hostels making sure that it continued to be a community um, community led educational institution environmental justice in the 80s we saw a lot of folks beginning to fight back against the kind of toxic um, environmental injustice that we saw. We saw in the 90s, a lot of organizing around police brutality, a lot of organizing around community development. And now in the 2000s, we're seeing a tremendous amount of organizing and movement building for economic democracy. Um, you know, we have a Bronx-wide planning process that I think represents that well. A place that by quantitative measure would say, where's the learning happening? Where's the economic activity happening? Where's the hope? when you really zoom down on the ground, 
you see a tremendous amount of solidarity, a tremendous amount of social cooperation, and a tremendous amount of enterprising, ingenious kind of action and group formation. And that's the Bronx that I know. We don't measure our Bronx by the deficits of um, poverty and et cetera, but we measure that Bronx by a fight for every mentality, which is community education, cooperation, and then building the things we need for the future. So that's some of what we talk about there. Yeah, that's really fantastic, Michael. And I think that gives um, such a great uh, uh, framework for this conversation, right? Um, and, and I've often heard you say, and I actually have a quote um, of you saying, you know, shared leadership means shared vision, shared vision, democratic governance, and values-based practice. Um, I'd like to unpack that a little bit. So maybe can you talk about the origins of BCDI and how BCDI is currently working to achieve shared leadership? Good thing for all of um, our future social justice and current justice, um, social justice leaders. Anything you say publicly can come back. Um, this is a good quote that uh, Bobby found. Um, so in BCDI, let's talk, I want to talk about shared leadership. So the Bronx Cooperative Development Initiative. Shared leadership is truly critical because it will take a movement in order to change outcomes in a more equitable direction. It's not going to, and this is a often in our field, we talk about this often. It won't be any superheroes, although there are many, right? We're a league of them of sorts. But it won't be just one, you know, super entrepreneurial person taking it on their back and driving it. It's really going to take a group effort. Think about Ella Baker, um, group-centered kind of leadership, right? So it's going to take a group effort, number one. Group efforts fundamentally have to be around community power. So what we've often seen in our neighborhoods, quite frankly, is that a lot of the decision-making and governance bodies are not necessarily run by residents. They're not necessarily in leadership by people of or from the community. And so we have to begin to think about that. How do the people who our decisions most greatly impact, not only do we want their advice, not only do we want their feedback, not only do we want their reactions, but we need their leadership, right? Where is their place in the decision-making process? These are decisions that fundamentally impact them. It's also to say that they are experts in their own experience. We often, you know, especially those of us, you know, we can get very technocratic and think that we've had to have the latest training in CRM and the latest, um, you know, degree offering. Those things are important, but there is a tremendous amount of experience and knowledge that's happened on the ground. And those people who have been learning by doing in our Bronx neighborhoods and communities, those folks should have decision-making and leadership um, positions in the work that we do. And lastly, the values-based key is important. Transactional relationships are not going to advance our movement for justice and equity. And I think we have to be kind of honest about that. And a lot of times in, in situations where there's material hardship, we need Wi-Fi access, we need computers, we need um, land, we need space. When we're in a situation of need, relationships often become very transactional. Who can do this for me? Who could do that for me? But we have to move one step out of that and begin to think about that shared leadership and shared values. They have to be around equity. They have to be around cooperation. How do we make decisions together? This is a place of democracy. And to get to the deepest part of democracy, voice is important and that that voice is in leadership is key. And one of the voices that, you know, quite frankly, have been marginalized enough are local leadership and BPOC leadership. Um, you know, a lot of our communities, we need to elevate that. So at BCDI, in short, um, we achieve all these things around, you know, we have leadership teams for how we set our strategy. So we check in with partners and we really get aligned on what are the key strategies we are pursuing, whether it be in participatory planning, uh, whether it be in innovation in tech. We bring together a group of local folks, not just to give advice, not just to react to proposals, but to really build together, number one. Number two, in order for that table to even work, this idea of leadership teams and, and, and that sort of thing, we have to align on values. And so for us, some of the values are around racial justice. Some of the values are around um, racial justice 
they're around, having the intergenerational lens, those sort of things are really critical. Um, so we come around on these values and then we share vision. So we are trying to fight forward. And so if you have to share leadership as a group, we're in this together. We have values that guide us, that we align to around justice and equity and defining what that means. How do we fight forward? Not only fighting back, our community has a lot of experience of fighting back against things. How do we fight forward? What's the Bronx we want to see five years from now, 10 years from now, 20 years from now? Let's be audacious. Let's be ambitious. Let's build that together. And so that's the final piece of our model. That that's that's really fantastic, Michael. Um, you know, a lot of what you're 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 surfacing right now um, about the origins of BCDI and what BCDI is really um, functionally about, you know, seems to be centered or anchored in trans um, kind of more transformational mindset um, and a, almost like a liberation uh, kind of philosophy, um, but one that is also inherently pro-democratic, right? Like democratizing the economy. And so I, I kind of want to get to now the nut of this conversation. Um, for the uninitiated, what is economic democracy and what does that look like in practice? Um, Sorry, economic democracy. <clears throat> One of the important things about economic democracy is there's a social component. And so we're looking at shifting relationships. We're moving away from relationships around domination, right? Uh, relationships that are transactional, the hierarchical models. We have to move away from that. How do we share power? How do we share wealth in our society is really key. So how do we move from landlords and tenants to coal owners? How do we move from the boss and the worker to worker owners, like we would in, work, in a worker cooperative model? How do we move from producers and consumers to co-producers, right? How do we make the things our society needs? How do we move from there's a leader, which indicates other people are following, to co-governance, that everyone has a seat at this table, everyone has a role to play. So economic democracy shifts not only our economy, right, and thinking about co-ownership of assets and businesses and more democratic decision-making. Not only is it an economic shift to address wealth inequality, but it's also a shift where we co-own and co-govern the major assets of our community. So that could be our housing, that could be our, you know, civic infrastructure, right? It could be things like our um, public serving institutions, et cetera. How do we move into a place that we co-govern and co-own those as well. So economic democracy at its key changes those social relationships into one that are more distributive and more shared. And number two, where we see that in the economy is that we move towards economic forms where the racial wealth gap very specifically becomes eliminated. And that has to happen with changing our relationships in uh, business and elsewhere. So at its core, that's what it philosophically um, represents. And then if we want to talk about in concrete, more worker cooperatives, more cooperative housing, um, more cooperative governance of our public sector, those would just be three things that we would, uh, I think, amplify at a higher level. That's, that's really helpful to start kind of unpacking this concept. Um, a great kind of follow up to that is, okay, great. That's a great new reimagining of our economic <laughs> One that is, let's say, democratized, right? Like really when you're talking about, you know, shared decision-making and shared ownership and shared governance of community assets, for example, like land, like housing, like the workplace and the profits uh, that are generated out of, out of business. Um, can you, because that seems so novel or foreign to our, you know, kind of U.S. or American concept of a capitalistic economy um, and how, how we do things and how things have always been done. Can you kind of share some success stories or case studies for economic democracy that either you've modeled or modeled after or that inform your approach? I think one of the, I think the, the case that I would want to highlight here is how we can do this economically. Um, so for example, in Cleveland, in Evergreen, um, we have a group of worker cooperatives 
who have been able to, one, emphasize BPOC kind of worker owners, right, that this is key, and be able to successfully have them create businesses that are able to contract with the public institutions of um, their city. The reason why this is important for, is for a few things, right? If we have workers, they get paid salary or they get paid wages or they get paid income. And we have to begin to think about if wealth disparities is the challenge, right? If we're saying that there's a racial wealth gap, there's racial wealth disparities, then will a salary, wage, income kind of strategy actually address a wealth challenge? Wealth is about ownership of equity assets. Like, does that solve the problem? And so by in Evergreen and in this part of um, in Cleveland, by focusing on worker co-ops and by turning the workers into co-owners, number one, they have equity, right, is key. And I think the second piece to that, not only is there the equity economically, <clears throat> there's a social dynamic. Now we're talking about BPOC folks who are leaders, right? They are business owners. They are co-governing. They are making decisions for the good of a broader set of stakeholders and, and interests. The key is that the anchor, the hospital, recognize the importance of this. And the hospital said, hey, you all work in um, laundry. So the gowns and the towels and all the things that we need that need to go through laundry, we'll make a relationship with you because we want the money we spend to go into economic democracy. We want the money that we spend to go into community wealth because this represents the type of investment that we want to make. I think that part is really, really critical, right? That the worker co-op piece came to be and the worker co-op piece was BPOC owned and led. And then the anchor institution, the public institution, recognized the importance of this and put money into it, right? And spent money with it <clears throat> is number one. Not only does it have a social kind of importance that, hey, these businesses are strong. They do have assets. We do need to um, support them. But also that the social component, that this is a democratic business and that we want to support them. So I think that that's one case study that makes a lot of sense. I think the other piece around economic democracy that I, I would cite as a success story is, you know, what we're doing in the Bronx, I have to say. So currently we have a Bronx-wide planning process that's occurring. I, I could drop the link in the chat in a moment. <clears throat> but we have over 24 organizations, um, and it's a multi-stakeholder group. So we have faith-based, we have labor, we have CBOs. And those folks have come together to endorse a people's platform for 2021. And we'll share the link. We'll share some of um, the aspects of that platform. But this group has come together. And not only have we aligned on the platform, but there's a shared vision, you know, around what we want to see investing in red line communities, right? Um, green, not only do we need a Green New Deal, but we need to be able to emphasize the firms and the um, groups that already have been doing this work, make sure they're not left behind. Intergenerational lens is important, et cetera. So a lot of the work that's happening in the Bronx-wide plan around bringing what would seem like a heterogeneous group, right? Bringing them, aligning together, sharing vision, having values, and then not making, I see there's a, a thing about democracy. Democracy is not around a few people making the decisions for all of us, right, which is a lot of what our typical structure is, somebody else goes and votes on a bill, someone else goes and votes on a legislation, some shareholder group makes the decisions about the business, but we come back into a different framework where the stakeholders who will be impacted, they're the ones making the decisions. That's what democracy, right, a deep, deep, deep democracy would be. No matter how challenging that democracy is, that's important that this decision making is shared, that it's not a small group, or it's not a quote unquote representative group that does so, but that the people most impacted are the ones that have decision making um, capabilities and power. I stop went long on that, but I'll pause there. No, no, that, no, that's fantastic. Um, and it, what it's doing is servicing some really great questions. So one, thank you to um, um, our wonderful folks in uh, the audience who are peppering uh, the chat with great questions, with links. Um, it seems like we have a learning community here with us today, folks who are ready to kind of share their own thoughts and experiences. So we want to continue to encourage that. Um, and please offer questions however you can. But if you can please use a Q&A, that'd be really 
really helpful to us. Um, Michael, you've talked about this before, and this is just another quote, as you could tell, I pay attention to your words. Um, you had talked about this idea of moving from community participation to community power. And it seems like that is one of the central elements of, of our understanding of democracy um, and our understandings of ownership and shared vision, right? Where we kind of really, um, you know, survive in a system where community participation is an end goal, trying to get folks registered, ready to vote and, and, and march and, and have their voice heard at the ballot box so we can send representatives to go make decisions on our behalf. It sounds like you're kind of taking democracy or this democratic principles a step further and saying, no, no, we're moving towards community power where there's shared vision, shared ownership amongst the members of the community. I guess, and I got, I, I wanna ground this in, in, in the practical, um, is that just like really, really messy? How does that work, right? <laughs> you know, the Bronx plan, right? A Bronx wide plan, it sounds, you know, incredibly chaotic, but beautiful at the same time. And, and perhaps that is what it is, but I wanna get a sense of, of what have been the outcomes of that? What have been the successes and the challenges of that approach? I definitely think, you know, even if you think about for a second, like the Black Panthers, right? Uh, Black Panthers, Young Lords, um, we think about survival programs, they would call it. We talk about community organizing. And part of that survival program or community organizing approach was around meeting the needs of folks where they're at right now. Um, I think in New York and throughout the country, right, the mutual aid networks that already existed and that amplified themselves and, and really um, stepped up to the plate during the pandemic and had, again, had existed before the pandemic, but those that really surfaced and bubbled up um, during the pandemic and continuing, we saw the strength of and the importance of you have to meet people where they're at. And where people are at right now is that there are, you know, things that need fighting back, right? Um, economic, um, um, housing insecurity, right? And, and we have to fight back on mass unjust evictions. We have to fight back on the incredible um, moral failure of, you know, lack of food access. We have to fight back on those things and we have to organize to meet the needs of folks currently. We have to make sure that there's no harm done. But there's, it's really important to fight forward. Um, and we have to fight forward so that way we're not continuing to just be reacting to what uh, unequal power structures trying to make us decide on. And, and how this represents itself in the Bronx wide work is that we have people assemblies, right? So the messiness of trying to do a democratic process um, and being member-led really begins with people's assemblies that we hold. And in these people assemblies, we facilitate kind of the container, right? So who are the stakeholders that need to be at the table, right? What are the kind of issues that are bubbling up locally? What are the visions that people have for what they would want to see? So take a sector like um, technology and manufacturing. We would surface, right? Who are the stakeholders that need to be at this table? Who are the stakeholders should be invited in addition to the open call? We need to kind of set the agenda. What are the critical topics in manufacturing tech that we should talk about right now? Is it that Amazon is buying warehouse space in the Bronx? Real life thing, right? Is it that in the South Bronx, we have La Peninsula opening and that's gonna be a community space. Maybe we could bring manufacturing and production jobs there. All right, let's have some of those folks. We have unions, right? We have unions, we have trade unions. Like who from the trade unions, um, how do we make sure they're at the table? Then we begin to think about, okay, we have the right people. We have the issues. What do we wanna see? So for example, a SWOT analysis. How do you do a big group SWOT analysis? It used to be a lot of big chart paper on walls, you know, in the digital world, it's a lot of jam boards and Google Docs, but we do a group SWOT analysis. We get into breakouts. We start to bring our knowledge and experience into looking at strength, looking at weaknesses, looking at threats, looking at opportunities. We start to break that down. And then we come around to, okay, let's, let's have some ranked choice voting, right? If we rank choice vote in our position, what do we, you know, what do we want to tackle? What do we want to prioritize? And then who do we need to go back to, right? to make sure what we prioritize and what we do align. There will never be a utopia, you know, um, where all agree. There will never be a utopia where it's, you know, zero sum, right? And I think that's kind of the mindset we have to step out of. But what we could step into is that, are we aligned enough for the future that is more equitable? 
even if I like vanilla ice cream, can I agree that, you know, strawberry mango might be the thing to move us forward? And is that good enough? Lastly, some of that comes around political education. Um, and so there's a certain level of political education that has to happen. Um, and that's really around how does the economy work? How does decision making work? Um, you know, I'll, lastly, to close this section out, I'll just give an example. You know, a lot of folks don't understand how their borough president office works. A lot of folks don't understand, per se, how, you know, there's an advisory group for uh, uh, Lincoln Hospital or the public hospitals. How do you get involved in those? What does your city council do? There's, there's that piece. And then there's the economic development pieces, right? And the economic development pieces are key. The subsidies that go to developers, the um, community benefits agreements that, you know, do they reflect community? There's all these nuances to economic development that we also have to have a political education around, historic and present. When you bring the education piece, along with the group facilitation piece on, on people's assemblies, this is how community have power. That knowledge gap is kind of closed, right? The group cooperative decision-making is built up. We align good and uh, close enough. Um, and then we together organize and act strategically. And that's where the power is held, when we organize and act strategically. But the groundwork has to be the knowledge, making sure we're knowledgeable about these things bring in our experience plus, you know, whatever else is happening and a group kind of model. It's difficult. Sometimes meetings are long. Sometimes agendas, you know, are not as tight as we want them to be. But, you know, and you can check out the, the you know, I'll share some links in the chat. But we think that this is the way forward to share power and share leadership. Yeah, yeah. No, that, I mean, it's, it's, the way you're laying it out, um, as expansive as it is, also kind of like just bringing it down to what for me feels like what I'm hearing is um, relationships, right? Um, our relationship to each other, our relationships to community, um, and what are the mechanisms and the vehicles and the tools that we have um, to move ourselves forward as groups, as people, right? To address the needs that need to be met. And I think you're, you know, it's really spot on because even for me, I only just learned um, how various community boards around our boroughs are um, created or how folks get on community boards and it's different by district and it just it's fascinating once you get into you know deep in to see how exactly our system works um, currently and so I kind of want to move towards like a the political lens here um, New York City is in the midst of a very crowded and consequential mayoral race um, sure. Have you heard any policies from candidates uh, that help in this transition to what you call a more democratic economy? So I think there's two kind of aspects here. I think one is, you know, folks running for office currently, it would be really important for them to think about social housing. Um, I really think that's a direction and a policy plank that we need folks to, um, think critically about that's going to be very important for our um going to be important for the city and going to be important for the society period what are the social housing models that um you know we had a moment of that right from public housing to limited equity um sort of arrangements mutual housing associations but supporting that at a policy level is really really key so community land trust is a huge movement that um currently happening. And so it'd be great for folks in the 2021 cycle and beyond to really take that seriously. Um, for, and it's important for all those of us in solidarity economy, economic democracy spaces. I think the second thing to get a little bit granular, um, Nick Knock. So Nick Knock is um, one of our important cooperator uh, networks in New York City. Nick Knock has a great policy platform. I'll, I'll drop it in the chat. And one thing they've been zeroing in on that I think um, some of the folks running for 2021 should look at, Nick Knock should be looking, I mean, sorry, folks should be looking at what we call procurement. So our city spends a ton of money. Schools spend, think about everything that a school or a public entity needs. They need toilet paper. They need um, hand soap. They need mops. They need things to use the mops with. They need a locksmith. They need any number of things. They look to what we call suppliers right? Businesses, either contractors or whatever. They look for businesses. They look for suppliers. 
all that money ultimately is local, right? The school is local. The, the, the park is local. The whatever, the office is local. Who are they using as their suppliers? It's a very key point. And worker cooperatives, right? We have a lot of worker cooperative um, um, enterprises and businesses in our um, city. How do we begin to get them to be in an equitable way? How do we begin to get them at the table to have a, a shot in the procuring um, that the city does and also that other public serving institutions do? How do we get these minority or quote unquote minority owned businesses, MWBEs, but really the worker co-ops? How do we begin to get them in this procuring system? How do we make it equitable for um, those folks? I think that's really key. The city is spending all this money and their suppliers should be local. So that's just two things I want to offer. I think folks should be looking at the social housing um, and we should be looking at what these candidates are saying around that. We should be looking at what these candidates are saying around MWBE um, procurement and specifically what ways worker cooperatives can um, you know, get a more equitable place in that ecosystem. And then check out the community land trust work. Check out the, um, I think somebody maybe dropped it in the chat. Check out the community land, um, uh, community land trust work. Check out Nick Knox pal policy platform. And then of course, check out um, the Bronx Wide Plans <laughs> platform as well as some places that when you hear these candidates speak, look for these things. Are they investing in their line communities? Are they talking about work co-ops? Are they solving the social housing problem, um, et cetera? Yeah, no, this is fantastic. And this is a great conversation. And uh, thank you all for um, participating in the chat in the way that you are. I feel like you're actually helping us build um, a knowledge base as a community, which is really wonderful and asking some really great and sometimes challenging questions, right? And it's it's funny what's come up a number of times is this um, concept of, of definitions and shared definitions. And, that, and I recognize that this is one of the really persistent challenges when we're talking about social justice leadership, right? And moving our groups, our teams, us, towards a, a shared vision that is more equitable. So I'd like to focus on conversation on how we might make this shift, right? To leverage kind of the might of the collective. Um, for me, I think about, um, you know, this process as a learning journey. And I think you share this perspective, Michael. Um, what kind of learning journey does an organization like BCDI or other organizations need to undertake not just to imagine, but to truly support this vision um, that you're kind of laying out uh, that BCI is working on? I think the learning journey, one, you know, it always starts with unlearning. <laughs> um, and, you know, I've worked in um, intergenerational spaces that are youth led, and we always talk about adults and how they need to unlearn certain um, ways of being and doing. So moving into cooperative models, you know, there's a certain thing around, you know, even if you're a nonprofit organization, for example, how do you do your strategic planning? Do you include if you serve members or quote unquote clients? How are they involved in your strategic planning? Right? Um, I, I think, uh, you know, stakeholder capitalism is a popular phrase these days. Uh, and, and not to go into that, but, you know, how do you bring the stakeholders into the work? So, nonprofits, how do you strategically plan? Do your members or do your clients, quote unquote, um, do the people you serve, are they a part of it? Are they a part of the vision setting? Are they a part of, you know, policy and procedure making? That's a huge challenge for us, right? I mean, fundamentally, we're used to like boards and that board kind of set structures and in leadership, executive management set structures to do it alongside the people that you, quote unquote, serve. I'm making it sound simple, but it's a huge institutional transformation but you know that's number one in terms of just thinking about who do you make your decisions with yeah. who's at the table when those decisions are made that's like a number one step and i think the other step that um i just want to highlight here in terms of what's the learning journey um you know the uh, tons of things are in the chat <laughs> where people can learn more about uh, these cooperative and solidarity models but I, I found the, the second thing is just a lot of patience. Like this is a new way of doing things for a lot of us who've been um, trained a certain way. It's going to be a new way of doing things. In the Mondragon region um, in Spain, we've, we've studied a lot of how they've developed a regional cooperative 
framework in Mondragon. And one key thing is that the K, in Mondragon, the K to 12 system brings co- a social cooperative, co- cooperativism from the beginning, right? Mm-hmm. So like cooperative ways of, of, of decision making, of organizational structure going into the economy, it's baked into the entire society. And I often wonder, you know, what would New York City uh, look like if institutionally we said, yeah, like cooperative, social cooperativism and that economic cooperativism would be um, useful and valuable in the early stages of um, our institutions. That would be so amazing. So but there's an unlearning piece. There's a just look at how you make strategy, who's at the table. When you make decisions about strategy, who's at the table, right? And, and do you make it alongside the people that you quote unquote serve and work with? And then lastly, um, the mindset piece and the patience to unlearn and how early and then what process can we do that for others? Um, mm-hmm. Those are just three things in the learning journey. Yeah, um, that, that's great. You know, and, and at this point, um, where we are in this conversation, um, we're kind of getting closer to the wind down phase. So I wanted to actually honor two questions that came up in the Q&A. Um, and so I'll pose the first one um, to you, which um, is a fascinating question about uh, how has the latest economic downturn affected the idea of economic democracy? And would this be an opportunity to advocate for this kind of thinking? Um, is this a challenge or is this an opportunity? How do you, how do you see it? That's a great question, number one. So I think the economic downturn um, associated with COVID-19 gives us a tremendous opportunity to even more emphasize why we need worker co-ops and why, excuse me, why we need economic democracy. Um, number one, you know, there's an incredible need to localize our procurement and manufacturing. I think that's clear um, that we need to, you know, have on-time production. We need um, closer to real-time production. Think about the gloves, the masks, the gowns, the, all those type of things. We, we clearly see a need that our suppliers need to be closer and that we need them um, in a way that makes, has more flexibility for what's happening on the ground. So from economically, we definitely need to be investing in, in you know, manufacturing and even service that happens local, I think, without a doubt. I think the second thing, the opportunity that COVID-19 has shown is that local people have the solutions, right? I keep coming back to the mutual aid point, but the tremendous mutual aid networks, again, many of them, I, I don't want to, I don't want it to keep sounding like it was brand new. Many of these mutual aid networks existed. Many of these cooperative frameworks existed, but now more than ever, we see the need to have social equity in those kind of formations and we need that. Um, you know, we can't afford that people who are fleeing. We can't afford to have folks who, um, um, you know, models where there's a small private group that kind of runs and control it. We need to open up those models for how we think about the solutions locally because those mutual aid networks show that local people have local solutions. Like they gotta figure it out. Um, and in fact, we under resource those groups. Um, those groups are going to do it anyway, but boy, if our public sector, um, would step into that, boy, if our private sector, you know, just, we don't still need money raining down on things, right? We just don't, you know, know all that, the money raining down is important, but we also need the investment in the social infrastructure that already exists. Put your money into these mutual aid networks, put your money into these solidarity groups, put, make them institutionally a way that you do things. That's as important as signing checks and giving them away. So I think there's a tremendous, I think what we've proven in mutual aid, what we've seen in terms of economic needs, is clear that the decision-making and economic um, structure has to change. Let's put our money and resources into the social infrastructure that is cooperative and solidarity orientated. That's what we need to do. That's the answer to the first question, Bobby. What's the other question in the Q&A? Uh, the other question in the Q and A um, was actually specific about um, because of our our importance that we're placing in this conversation on community. Um, do we think it's imperative to vote as a block, even when that means abstaining from supporting the lesser evil? Well, okay, that's a good question. So, um, so voting is important, but it, it, if I could, 
the challenge is that our social problems, quote unquote, and our gaps go beyond the vote, right? So we need voting in order to think about who's at the table right now. But I think the other critical piece that we need to think about is what happens after. So Biden just, you know, for example, Biden just did his first 100 days, I guess, uh, one day this week. The policies, the legislation, the discussion that was happening in the last 100 days is almost more important than the election result. It's not to say the election result was not important. I want to be clear about that. But the bills, the legislation, the policy discussion, the ideas, those are the things that ultimately get implemented. And that's where we need to be as a block around, you know, you said Green New Deal, but I'm not talking about just Green New Deal. I want to get really granular. Like when that money comes down, where is it coming? Like who is it coming to? Are you going to shift the inst- Like we have to get really, really granular about that. We have to get really, really um, um, deeply embedded. And that's where there's a unity of acting in unity and acting in, 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 in solidarity would be really, really key. Um, so yet in the vote part, it's important to get out there. It's important to like be a part of that decision-making process. But I think there's a critical need for us to think about after that, what's the civic infrastructure, just by a disclaimer at BCDI, that's our thought. We've kind of created this Bronx wide um, group that, you know, runs campaigns and is trying to fight forward and is aligned in cooperative and participatory ways. But the whole point of it is not about an election. After the election, how do you get that agenda implemented to really actualize, not just to be in the season of promises, which is what we're in electorally right now? I hope that answers your question. Well, I think of what you just said, what is so powerful is something that I very much believe in my core and we preach this in the MPA program, right? Is, you know, at the end of the day, you know, great ideas are great ideas, but you have to roll up your sleeves um, and, and really get your hands dirty, right? Like you've got to get granular. You've got to draw some lines in the sand and, and pilot test and figure out which of your ideas are usable, which ones are feasible, which ones will carry you forward as a individual, as a group, as a community, um, and what is not going to work. And the only way you do that is through experience by doing right. And not just by, you know, crafting ideas. So I think, you know, what you say really resonates with me, uh, Michael, we kind of share this, um, this, this unique space of um, kind of being pandemic, pandemic era people, right? Where we <laughs> enter new roles um, at the beginning of a pandemic. And I know you kind of were, were hired on to, to BCDI, um, I think maybe just a month before I was hired on in my role here um, at City College. So I kind of wanted to give you um, an opportun- opportunity as kind of, you know, some closing remarks as to, you know, uh, Reflecting back on this pandemic year, what have you kind of learned, right? Whether it's about yourself or about just this kind of space of social justice leadership, um, you know, kind of what is your reflection if you could offer that for us? Uh, pandemic leadership. So um, hopefully there are many less pandemics so we don't have this question repeat, but one is uh, joy and rest are important. Some of you colloquially, you might uh, see on Instagram, we have the, uh, the NAP ministry, <laughs> which is a, a great Instagram, but around the, the idea that we need rest and we need joy and in movement building work, you cannot under emphasize that. We need work, we need rest, we need joy. And as a leader, making sure that there's space for that, making sure that there's space for rest, making sure that there's space for joy, um, starting meetings with gratitude, ending meetings with gratitude, recognizing I don't care what the sick day count says, whatever, like people need healing and rest. How do we do that? Number one. Number two, infusing creativity into the work, right? We are solving adaptive challenges around here. The world is changing every second, every moment. You know, there's a lot of uncertainty. So leaning into your creativity. Um, Everything from Zoom has the whiteboard function and you do some doodling, you know, use the arts, like use creativity to really get your team one, to de-stress, but two, to get their juices flowing that there are challenges to be solved and we need creativity, right? We need a deep level of creativity to do that. And I think the last kind of thing that I've recognized is now more than ever, we need vulnerability. There is a certain kind of practice that 
the leader knows everything. We come in very stoic and like, I got it all together. And like, I know this being a leader, you know, sharing leadership in these times are incredibly, is incredibly difficult. Where is the space to be vulnerable about what has not worked? Where's the space to be vulnerable about failure? Where's the cultural shift that we allow grace for, you know, yeah, that didn't work. Yeah, that was a challenge. Where's the room and grace for that? Um, are we going to be so quantitatively um, um, obsessed that the metrics will say, oh, you didn't perform and you're out? Um, or are we going to have room for continuous improvement that we learn by doing, that we measure? But the vulnerability is so key. A lot of people have talked about it. I'm not like revolutionizing this in any sort of way, but um, vulnerability around what has not worked, vulnerability around what is a challenge. Honestly, we don't want to drive people out the sector. We need that. And if we want to really be committed to justice, being committed to justice is around recognizing fault and then moving forward. We're asking that of the elites. We need to do that inside of our movement as well. So those are the three things. Get some rest, have some joy, tap into your creativity. And last but not least, let's, let's be vulnerable so that way we can learn and do better together. Wow, that is beautiful snaps all around Michael because that is so it resonates so deeply with me and my own experience and I very much appreciate you sharing so much of your time with us this afternoon um, sharing your perspective sharing the work that BCDI is doing helping to advance um, this concept of economic democracy uh, with all that comes with it and all the, the nagging and unanswerable questions that come with it um, and being able to bring that to a broader community. Michael, thank you so much for your time. It is much appreciated um, and it's been a pleasure to work with you and to partner and co to collaborate with you. Um, Bobby, thank you. I saw there was a lot of questions I did not get to. So I think Less parking lot, do we need a part two? And what does it look like? And how does it happen? Um, I would definitely make the time. In the spirit of shared leadership, also it'd be great to have the other folks that help make all this work happen. You know, like we have a group conversation with some folks too. It's not a, a no single person making it work. I want to give a big shout out to my team at BCDI and our partners and network that make this um, make this work happen. Thank you all for the space and the time. Looking forward to more conversation. Oh man, thank you so much. To our community, thank you so much for being here with us this afternoon. Please enjoy the rest of your Friday. I think there was so much equity built in this conversation and I hope we carry this momentum forward. That's something that I'm gonna be working towards. And I know um, the MPA program and the Colin Powell School, um, this is the lane that we want to continue to occupy in collaboration with you all, our community. So thank you all so much. And thank you for the folks who are behind the scenes who help to make this happen. I hope everybody enjoys their Friday. <laughs>